Okay, good morning, everyone. So we're going to enter the last phase of the class now. We have about eight lectures left. Um, in fact, I guess I should tell you a little bit about the timeline. So uh, I will be away at a conference next Monday. No, not next Monday. Uh, the Monday of Thanksgiving week, there will be no classes, no Monday and no Wednesday. Okay, so that entire week is completely free. Uh, so we'll have the rest of this week and next week. And then we'll have the week that we get back after Thanksgiving holiday. Okay, so that's eight more lectures. And originally I thought about having a unit on linear algebra and then a unit on vector calculus. But I think that that's a little bit redundant. So I'm going to try to combine the two. Um, because really linear algebra and vector calculus have a lot in common. Okay, so I'm going to kind of interweave these two topics together. Um, today we're going to be doing an overview of uh, vectors, so just kind of vector spaces. Um, so mostly we're thinking about vectors in 3D. So this is going to include things like um, inner product, and the norm of a vector, and the cross product of a vector. And so most, I'm assuming that most of what I'm going to talk about today is review for most of you. But I think it's still good to kind of refresh everybody on the notation that I'm using, and just remember kind of exactly what um, vectors and inner products and norms and all of these things are. Because in the next two lectures, we're going to start introducing the idea of what a vector space is more generally. So, you know, we're talking about physical vectors in 3D in 3 space. But most of these ideas generalize to vectors in an arbitrary n-dimensional space, like the state vectors we used uh, for our ordinary differential equations. Okay, so we've already been looking at linear algebra a little bit in the context of differential equations. We looked at eigenvalues and eigenvectors and coordinate systems and determinants. And here we're going to revisit them in a little bit more um, of a canonical way in the framework of linear algebra. Um, so we're going to start talking about vector spaces, but we're also going to introduce the concepts of um, differential operators. Okay, like the gradient, the divergence, and the curl um, objects, which are essentially related to inner products and cross products um, of vectors in 3D. Okay, so this is going to serve as the foundation for vector spaces, and then the work we do in vector calculus with uh, div, grad, and curl. Okay, and all of you have seen div, grad, and curl, I'm assuming, um, but maybe it's been a little while for some of you. Okay, so we're going to start off pretty, uh, you know, at the basic foundational level. Um, so we're just going to talk about vectors to start. Okay, so we're going to consider a three-dimensional space. And we all like three space because we feel like we live in three space. Uh, I say we feel like it because those, those are the directions that we, you know, walk around and move and pinpoint physical objects. Uh, but there's also dimensions of time and other dimensions. Um, so it's always hard for me to draw a right-handed coordinate system because I'm left-handed. And everything in my body tells me that I should draw this the other way. But I'll try very, very hard to draw a proper right-handed coordinate system. So if you have x and y, and you rotate your hand in the direction x goes into y, then z should pop out the direction your thumb's pointing. How many of you are left-handers? Just curious. OK, a few. Not, not many. Wow, two, three. OK. Um, once I lived in a house with 10 people, and four of us were left-handed, which is strange. OK, so we have a three-dimensional space uh, given by these coordinate directions, x, y, and z. And we're going to introduce the idea of a unit vector in the x, the y, and the z direction, because we're going to use this notation uh, a lot in the, the things that follow. So before, before a vector was x bar, uh, underbar was a vector. 
But now uh, I'm going to write x with an arrow on top as a vector. And part of the reason for doing this is that I really want to indicate that these are physical pointer type vectors. They're really pointing to a physical location in x, y, z coordinates. Okay? Um, and it also looks a little bit better with the math later on. So we're going to define these unit vectors uh, in the x, y, and z directions, and we're going to call them i, j, and k. Okay, and these are really vectors. X is a, uh, i is a vector, j is a vector, and k is a vector, and they each have unit length, and they're only aligned in one of the coordinate directions. Okay? So i, j, and k are unit vectors, meaning that they have unit length. Okay? And we've talked about this a little bit before, but the i, j, and k directions form an orthonormal basis for this three-dimensional vector space. Okay? So these form an orthonormal basis. So what's the difference between orthonormal and orthogonal? Yeah, so orthonormal means that they're all normalized to have unit length. I could have orthogonal vectors, 2i, 3j, and 14k. Those would certainly be an orthogonal set of vectors. But if they have unit length, then they're orthonormal. They're normalized. Okay? And a basis just means that every possible direction in my vector space can be written as a linear combination of these primal basis vectors. So we'll talk a little bit more about what a basis means formally when we get to vector spaces, and that'll be a little bit later in the next couple lectures. Okay? Um, sometimes we call this 3D space a Euclidean space because all of the coordinate directions are straight. Um, and the space is the same no matter where I put the origin. No matter where I zoom in, the space basically has the same flat x, y, and z directions. There are lots of spaces that are curved. Um, like if you write down um, the gravitational potential of a you know, heavy planet or a neutron star or something, it actually bends space around it. So the equations of motion would be written in a curved space. But we're talking about nice, simple, flat coordinate systems called Euclidean spaces. Okay. So if I was on the surface of a sphere, like the Earth, if I was on a big, flat field, then it would look locally like a Euclidean space because it's locally flat. Even though if I zoom, zoom way out, we would see that the surface is actually curved and is not that Euclidean. Okay, um, so I'm going to go through the basics. We're going to go through vector addition, vector subtraction, and then we're going to get to the dot product and cross product. Okay, so. In my x, y, and z spaces, I can have my vector uh, a and b. And I'm sure all of you know that to add a and b, we essentially just tack a onto the end of b, or vice versa, we could tack b onto the end of a. And we get this vector uh, a plus b. Okay, pretty straightforward. Um, and you can write this like, um, so I haven't actually told you what a is. Let's say a is some component a i, a1 in the ith direction, plus a2 in the j direction, plus a3 in the k direction. Okay, so we can write any vector. I told you that i, j, and k formed an uh, orthogonal basis. And so I can write any vector a as some linear combination, some 
you know, constants times i, j, and k added together. Every vector can be written this way. B is going to be the same thing, b1, i, plus b2, j, plus b3, k. And so a plus b, if I have a1 in the x direction and b1 in the x direction, and I add them together, I just get a1 plus b1 in the x direction. plus a2 plus b2 in the j direction, plus a3 plus b3 in the k direction. Okay? Um, if I subtract these vectors, so I have a and b, if I subtract these vectors, then I essentially am looking for the vector that would take me from one point to the other. So this is uh, b minus a. And the way we can figure out kind of what direction this arrow points and really justify why it's pointing in this direction is because if I added a to b minus a, I should end up with b. Okay, so if I add a plus b minus a, it has to take me to this direction, b. Okay, good. Um, so we're going to pick up a little steam. Uh, so we always, before, have written vectors as column vectors, right? Little n by 1 or 3 by 1 matrices, okay? So we can write uh, vectors as 3 by 1 matrices. And this is what we've always done in the past. So we can say that A is equal to A1, A2, A3. B is equal to B1, B2, B3. Um, I, J, and K are super easy, right? I is just 1, 0, 0. J is 0, 1, 0. And K is 0, 0, 1. Okay, so what we're talking about here is a way of representing a direction in space. Okay, A, B, uh, B minus A, A plus B, these are all directions in a three-dimensional space. They all point to some object. Okay, and this is one way that we can represent that information is in a column vector. Okay, good. Um, so now we're going to talk about inner products. And inner products are going to be extremely useful. So the reason I'm starting off really, really slow today is because the basic ideas of inner products and cross products and vectors, these completely generalize to higher dimensional vectors. And so in the next part of this class, in ME565, we're going to be talking about how to solve partial differential equations, uh, Fourier transforms, Laplace transforms, things like that. And all of those ideas naturally live in a big high dimensional vector space. Okay? That means a vector space where your vector is really, really, really tall with a lot of entries in it. Okay? And things like inner products generalize, they, they don't just apply to vectors, they also apply to things like functions. I can tell you how close two functions are to each other by looking at the inner product of those functions. Okay? So I really want to start building this up simply uh, so that we're really, really comfortable with these ideas because we're going to bend them to the limits of their definitions. So I want you to know what the limits of those definitions are. Okay? So for an inner product, um, there's a lot of different ways to write this. Everyone has their own favorite way. I'll just tell you all three of the kind of common ones. So. We usually write a dot product, sorry, an inner product with a dot, and sometimes we call it a dot product because you're dotting these together. So a dot can be a vector, sorry, a verb of what you do to two vectors if you take their inner product. So a dot b is just a1, b1, plus a2, b2, plus a3, b3. And notice that this is just a number. 
I took two vectors, I dotted them together, I get a number. Okay, so this is a scalar. It's not a vector. Another way to write this is uh, you can say A paired with B using these funky brackets. Okay, this is the Dirac. Um, this was invented by Dirac for quantum mechanics, and he was using functions and kind of generalizing this idea of an inner product. So this is a Dirac bra ket notation. So this is a bra and this is a ket, and they form a bracket. Pretty clever. Um, and you can put stuff inside there too. Um, so another thing we can do, if we choose to write our vectors as column vectors, which is what I kind of prefer to think about, I always think of vectors as being column vectors in my mind, then I have uh, A transpose B. That's also a way of writing the inner product, right? If I take um, A transpose, now it's this row vector, times B1, B2, B3, my column vector, and if I multiply this matrix by this matrix, I get the sum of all those pairs, which is just a number. Okay, so these are three different ways of writing the inner product. Um, I'm totally fine with any of them. Usually I'm going to write it this way because this is kind of the most common. Um, if we are ever programming it in a computer, I would write it this way. And if we were doing quantum mechanics, we'd write it this way. Okay? Okay, good. Um, so inner products are super, super useful because they allow us to do lots of things that we want to do to physical objects. They allow us to measure the lengths of a vector. So there is an induced length for all vectors given by this inner product. Um, it also allows you to take two vectors and project one into the direction of the other one. Okay, so those are the two things we're going to look at that are kind of the number one and number two most important uses of an inner product. Um, okay, so let's do that. And of course, we didn't have to use the i, j, and k directions. We could have introduced cylindrical coordinates um, or spherical coordinates, which at some point we will do. Uh, but for now, we're going to use these nice Cartesian Euclidean coordinates, okay? Because they're nice and Euclidean. Okay, so from the Pythagorean theorem, we know that the length of A is equal to the square root of A1 squared plus A2 squared plus A3 squared. Okay? I just take the sum of the squares of all of the components. I take the square root. I can do this because A1, A2, and A3 point in different directions. They're in the i, the j, and the k direction, and because they're completely orthogonal. If i, j, and k were not orthogonal, then this would not be the length. This completely rests on the fact that i, j, and k are orthogonal to each other, or else the Pythagorean theorem would not hold, because you need right triangles, right? And so we call this length. We have a special symbol for it in math, which is double left bars, double right bars. Okay, this is kind of like the absolute value of A, but it's a stronger absolute value because this is for a vector, not just a scalar. So this kind of absolute value of my vector is called a norm. And it's exactly equal to this quantity, which is the same as A dotted with A square root. All right, if I took a dot with a, I would have a1, a1, plus a2, a2, plus a3, a3, right? a1 squared plus a2 squared plus a3 squared to the 1 half power. Okay? So we can always define a norm by using the inner product of those vectors. Okay, and this norm tells me how long this vector A is, right? A short vector A will have a small norm. A long vector A will have a long norm. Um, if I have two vectors A and B, and I want to know how far apart they point, 
then I would take the norm of a minus b. And that tells me how far apart these two vectors are pointing, the distance between a and b. Now, I can generalize this notion of an inner product, and we're going to do that so that instead of just working on three vectors, we can work on really, really, really huge vectors, or we can even work on general infinite dimensional vector spaces, like the space of all polynomial functions. Okay, so later we're going to find that the space of polynomials satisfies the definition of a vector space, which I haven't told you about yet. And so it's possible to define an inner product, and it's also possible to say what is the length, what's the distance between two polynomials or two functions, right, two Taylor series expansions. So this idea of a norm is way, way more general than just three vectors, but it has a super simple interpretation in the case of three vectors. It's just the length of that vector. And it's the inner product to the half power. Okay? Any questions at this point? No? This is pretty much all review? Yeah, mostly. Okay. Um, so one thing we can do that's kind of uh, a common thing is I can take a vector that does not have unit length and I can make it into a vector with unit length. So um, I can normalize. It's a nice, funny word. So the reason we call this a norm is because we, it's the length, and we can use it to normalize a vector. So I can normalize a vector a by just saying a divided by the length of a. Okay? And now this is a unit vector. Or a vector with unit norm, with norm equal to 1. So norm means length. Um, unit length means it's a unit vector. So I normalize a by dividing by its length. Does this make sense? Okay, if you took the norm of this, it would have norm 1. Okay, good. Okay, so this is kind of the algebraic definition of inner product, right? I took a vector A, which was a column vector, and I multiplied it by its transpose, and we got a length. So now we're going to talk a little bit about the geometry of what an inner product means. Um, and so this is really a measure of orthogonality. So the inner product will tell me how close or how far from orthogonal are two vectors, okay? which is a really, really, really important concept. So if I'm going to create a basis for some vector space, I had better be able to tell if my vectors are orthogonal or not. Okay. So the way we're going to do this is we're going to construct two vectors again. Um, Okay, so we're going to have our two vectors, A and B. And these two vectors have some angle between them. Okay? There's some angle between these vectors. And we're going to essentially be able to... Um, write the dot product of a and b in terms of the length of a, the length of b, and this angle theta. So we can say a dot b is equal to, well, I think it's got to be the length of a times the length of b, and it's got to be times cosine of theta. Because we know, so I'm acting like you don't know anything about inner products, but really you know a lot about inner products. You know that if A and B are pointing in the same direction, then that's the way that you get the biggest inner product, right? And if A and B are completely orthogonal, then they would have zero inner product, right? This is a fact that we know. If A and B are orthogonal, they have zero inner product. If A and B point in the same direction, they have kind of the maximal inner product. And so I have the length of A times the length of B times cosine of theta. When this theta is zero, 
it's 1. And when theta is 90 degrees, when they're completely perpendicular, this dot product is 0. OK? So uh, if parallel, then a dot b is just the length of a times uh, the length of b. And if perpendicular, then the dot product is 0. OK? So that's kind of a nice uh, geometric interpretation of what the dot product's doing. You could prove this formula is true by using the law of cosines from trigonometry, which I don't remember. Um, but I do remember this, because this one actually makes sense physically. Um, what else? Okay, so the really, really, really important property of inner products, um, aside from the fact that you can define a length, there's a second super important property of inner products, and it's that you can use the inner product to take a vector and project it into the direction of another vector. Okay, so vector projection is probably the most, um, it's, it's at least one of the two most important properties of the inner product, is that you can you can define vector projections. And we're also going to use this a ton in ME 565. So I'll tell you what it looks like first, and then I'll tell you how we're going to use it. OK, so let's say, how do I do this? We're going to project A in the direction of B. So I have some little B vector here. For now, let's assume that B has unit length. So. Assume that the norm of B equals 1. OK, unit length. And we're going to have some A vector. Then oftentimes what I want to do is I want to project A into the B direction. So I'm going to write this out because the English is important. So we're going to project. A into the B direction. So especially if B has unit length, I think of it as a direction. All unit vectors point in a direction, and they uniquely define that direction. Okay. So what I want to know is how much of A is in the B direction. So what I really want to know is in the B direction, what is the projection of A onto this B direction? How long is this projected black dashed vector? OK, so this dashed black vector, the length of it, so the length of my dashed black vector is equal to A dot B. OK? The dot product of A with B is the length of this dash black vector. It's how much of A is in that unit B direction. And then if I actually want to represent this dashed black line as a vector, I would say um, A dot B, this is just a number, it's just a length, times B. This is a vector pointing in the b direction. It has length a dot b. And so it has the length of how much of a is in that b direction. OK, how many of you like me to say this again? Does that make sense? Yeah. OK, good. So this is uh, a projected onto b. Yeah. Why is it in that expression? Yeah, so if b didn't, good, you read my mind. If b is not equal to 1, then you need a dotted with b in the b direction divided by the norm of b squared. Because I pick up a length here and here. Because right, I have two factors of the length of b in the numerator, so I need to cancel out two factors of the length in the denominator. Yeah, so this is kind of the generic uh, projection. Good. Yeah? 
Yeah, uh, the second part? Uh, the first part. The first part, yeah. So if I have some direction B, and I want to know, and I have some vector A, and I want to know how much of A is pointing in the B direction, so I want to decompose A into some B part and then some other part, I take the dot product of A and B, and that tells me the length of how much of A is in that B direction, as long as B is a unit vector. Norm of B squared. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because you get a norm of B from here and a norm of B from here. So you have to have a norm of B squared. Okay, good. Um, okay, I have time to tell you about two super useful inequalities. Um, so I'm going to have some of this on the homework because I don't think I have time to kind of go through all of the neat identities about dot products and vector products and all of this um, in class. So I'm going to tell you what some of these things are, and I'm going to ask you to verify some of them on the homework, OK? So there's something called the Cauchy-Schwartz inequality. Um, anytime you see Cauchy, it's a big deal. And Schwartz, less of a big deal. Um, OK, so the Cauchy-Schwartz inequality says, for any two vectors, we have the following identity. So A dotted with B is just a number, right? It's a scalar number. And so I can take its absolute value. So the, the magnitude of the, this dot product is always less than or equal to the length of A times the length of b. It's kind of an obvious inequality, actually, right? Because this dot product is equal to this times cos theta. So it has to be less than or equal to 1. This is exactly equal if these are pointing in the same direction or if one of them is equal to 0. OK, an even more useful identity is called the triangle inequality. And the triangle inequality is used, it's one of the most used theorems in all of math. And it's not just used to prove things, it's useful to give us kind of a geometric intuition about how vectors work. Okay? So this triangle inequality says that the norm of A plus B is always less than or equal to the norm of A plus the norm of B. This has a super simple geometric interpretation. I have some A, and I have some B. And so we know that the vector A plus B is something like here, right? Now, this vector can only be equal to the sum of these lengths when A and B point in exactly the same direction because they're adding in the same direction. Anytime A and B don't point in the same direction, part of A is canceling some part of B. Okay, there's like this orthogonal direction where A is positive and B is negative and they're canceling. So some part of A and B are being canceled out. And so this length, A plus B, is always less than or equal to A length of A plus length of B. And they're only equal when A and B point in exactly the same direction. It's that simple. If you want to see the proof, um, it's in my notes, but I don't really want to write it down. It's kind of boring. Um, but it's also really, really useful. And it uses the Cauchy-Schwartz inequality, which is probably why people gave it a name. Any questions about inner products? OK, uh, that's all I want to say about inner products for now. Inner products are going to come back in a big way when we talk about vector spaces. They're one, of, one of the defining properties of a vector space is that you can define an inner product. So you can define the length between two vectors or the length of a vector. Um, and it's a, an idea that generalizes way, way beyond three vectors. 
Okay, so we're going to use it to define the length between functions, um, and these functions might be the solutions to partial differential equations in a infinite dimensional function space called a Hilbert space. But don't worry, we're going to do that next quarter after Christmas, so it's so far away we don't have to think about it. Okay, so now we're going to talk about the cross product. The cross product is cool because it also has a great geometric interpretation. Okay, all of these things are they're vectors, right? They're fundamentally geometric objects. Uh, so we still have our two vectors, a, um, a1i plus a2j plus a3k, and we have b equals b1, shouldn't have erased it, plus b2j plus b3k. The cross product, um, how many of you have, like, know how to compute the cross product right now. If I give you two vectors, you'd compute the cross product. It's almost ever, right? And what would you use? MATLAB? <laughs> okay, good. So see, this is actually, I don't remember how to do this in MATLAB. I'm assuming there's a cross command, but I don't know. Um, so the way that we all learn how to do this in school is using the determinant of a matrix that we construct, right? Okay, so the cross product is given by this cross, A cross B, and we say A cross B is equal to the determinant of a very special matrix given by I, J, K, A1, A2, A3, B1, B2, B3. Now, as far as I'm concerned, this is a pretty dangerous notation because i, j, and k are not numbers, and so acting like they're numbers in a matrix is pretty dodgy. But this is a nice way to remember the cross product formula, and it actually is kind of amazing. Remember I told you that the geometric interpretation of the determinant is the volume of uh, the span of these vectors, either the row or the column vectors? That same interpretation applies um, for this cross product, which is kind of amazing. So this determinant really does have a geometric meaning, even though we're plugging in weird vectors in a matrix and it doesn't make sense. Okay, so the way you take this determinant, I'm just going to write it out in long form one time, is you take i times this 2 by 2 determinant. Okay, so it's i times the determinant of a2, a3, b2, b3. Uh, not plus j, minus j times the determinant of these, this 2 by 2, which is um, a1, a3, b1, b3, plus k times the determinant of a1, a2, b1, b2. Okay, and you could take these determinants and you get a2, b3, minus a3, b2, a1, b3, minus a3, b1, dot, 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 right? You can take these determinants and you get some funky expression in terms of all of these a's and b's. But notice this is a vector. The cross product is fundamentally a vector, not a scalar, which is interesting. It's somehow different fundamentally than the inner product. The inner product takes two vectors, gives me a number. Cross product takes two vectors, gives me a vector. Now, it's interesting that this A cross B vector is perpendicular to both A and B. Okay? How would I verify that... So this is a homework problem. How would I verify that A cross B is perpendicular to both A and B? dot product of, of this with A, and then the dot product of this with B. Okay, I'm going to write this out long form because I'm going to use it later. So this equals um, A2B3 minus A3B2I minus uh, A1B3 minus A3B1J plus A1B2 minus A2B1K, okay? So you would take this vector and you would dot it with A, 
you know, this times A1 plus this times A2 plus this times A3, and you're going to find that all of this stuff just magically cancels out. This vector is perpendicular to both A and B. Not only are they perpendicular, but they also follow a right-hand rule. So if I have A and B, then A cross B points perpendicular following the right-hand rule. Now, this isn't some magic way of the universe telling me that I'm fundamentally wrong. This is just how we define the cross product. Okay? If we wanted to define it left-hand, I would just flip B and A. No problem. Okay? So left-handed does mean sinister, right? The Latin word for left-handed is sinistrum. Sinis I don't know what it is. It's basically sinister which I've always appreciated. Okay, now a couple other things. Yeah, so that's going to be a homework problem. Okay, good, almost done. Um, so the idea here of this cross product, if we're going to think about it geometrically again, we have x y and z, and we have our vectors, um, oof, I do this really badly, we have our vectors a and b. So the, the length of my cross product, the magnitude or the norm of my cross product is equal to the area of this parallelogram. which is starting to seem very reminiscent of what we learned about determinants earlier, right? I'm taking the determinant of something where one row is A, one row is B, and the other row is I, J, K. And it turns out that the norm of my cross product, this thing A cross B, has a length, so it's perpendicular to both A and B, and its length is equal to this area here, the area of this parallelogram between A and B. You could prove this. Um, it is in the lecture notes. Um, the basic idea is that if I take A and B, then they have some angle theta between them. And this height here is equal to the norm of B times sine theta. And so the area of this parallelogram is norm of A, kind of the base, times the height, which is norm of B sine theta. Now, I didn't prove that this is what the cross product's equal to, but you can take the cross product and take the norm of this nasty vector expression, and you can show, and I do in the notes, that it's equal to this area of the parallelogram spanned by A and B. Okay? So if A and B are nearly, nearly, nearly parallel, then this parallelogram has almost no area, and my cross product is super short. But if A and B are perpendicular, then this parallelogram is going to have the maximal possible area, and A cross B is going to be as long as possible. Okay, so the length of A cross B depends on how orthogonal A and B are. Okay, so this is starting to look very reminiscent of the dot product. Right? The dot product was length of A, length of B, cos theta. This is uh, equal to the length of A cross B. Okay. Any questions so far? Okay, one last thing. And this is uh, one of my favorite things about the cross product is that there's a really, really nice way of writing it as a matrix. So how many of you have seen a cross product written in terms of a matrix multiplication before? Okay, even in a really dry lecture, I like to have at least one thing you haven't seen before. Um, so we have this expression for A cross B equals all of this stuff, right? And so I can take that and I can write it going to get rid of everything but the bottom row. 
Okay, this is um, A cross B on the bottom. So what I can do is if I write B as a column vector, B1, B2, B3, then there is some matrix that will give me A cross when multiplied by B. Okay? There's some matrix that when I multiply it by a column vector B, it does exactly the same thing as A cross B. Okay, so how do we do it? So what we're reading out here, we're going to get a vector out, which is A cross B. And this thing's going to have an I, a J, and a K component, right? A cross B is a vector, so it has an I component, a J component, and a K component. So what is my I component of the cross product? A2, B3, minus A3, B2. Okay, so... A3, B3, minus, ooh, did I mess that up? A2, B3, minus A3, B2, with a 0. Okay, so this row, when I multiply it by B, gives me this ith term of my cross product. Okay, what about my J term? What, how do I get my J term? Well, I have a minus, a minus, minus, a plus A3, B1. So plus A3, B1. I have no B2s. And I have a minus A1, B3. And then the last row, I can read it out as minus A2, A1, 0. So this matrix is the A cross matrix. This is a matrix that does the same thing as A cross, and it's just waiting for a vector to multiply it. So A cross is a matrix just waiting for a vector to take the cross product with. Okay? This is a really special type of matrix. It's called skew symmetric because it's symmetric about the axis, about the diagonal, except all of the terms are minus of each other. So this is called skew symmetric. It's a really special type of matrix. This is going to be particularly useful when we start thinking about things like the curl, del cross. Okay, so if A was a vector partial, partial x, partial, partial y, partial, partial z, let's say this is A cross, I can write the curl as a matrix of partial derivatives, partial, partial z partial partial y, minus partial partial x, and so on and so forth. So I can write a matrix that will do the curl for me. Okay? Okay, that's all I want to say today. Soon, either next time or on Monday, we're going to talk about vector spaces. And in the other lecture, we're going to talk about div, grad, and curl. We're going to start using vectors of differential operators. Okay? Okay, thank you.